Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, today's session, we're going to cover covered calls and um, credit spreads on a high-level basis. And um, the, these, these two concepts themselves are um, uh, pretty deep, but I will uh, try to touch base uh, the key points uh, that are involved in uh, covered calls and credit spreads, basically trying to touch the concept um, rather than the technicals inside today. Uh, today, it will mostly not be a technical analysis, but then it, it will more, more or less like be a understanding of the concept for, about uh, covered calls and credit spreads. But also, we will be using, at the end, we will be using Bollinger Bands to pick up uh, strikes for either covered calls or um, credit spreads. So let's look at a basic example here. This this example is probably something that you all would have seen somewhere um, in any of the YouTube channels or the blogs when you're trying to learn about covered calls. So this is something that, you know, when I was thinking, you know, how do I present covered calls to the group? And then I was like, okay, so let's take the basic example. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let me write down a few points here. I, this, this particular example here was shared in the chat. Um, if anyone is looking for this te template here. So let's just say, you know, there are two characters here, John and Kyla. And John has a house. He he buys a house, but then he already has like four or five houses. John's plan is not to stay in this house, but then he wants to rent it out, right? Like many people have multiple houses where they rent it out, right? So John has four four five houses. He buys another one and he buys it for 500,000, right? And he will post an ad on um, Zillow or you know, most, most of us use like Suleika or whatever, right? So he posts an ad and he says, okay, these are the conditions, right? So I will rent this house on a weekly basis and the rent per week is $500. And at the end of the week, if the tenant likes the house, he can pay me 510,000 called strike. Just, just don't try to like, like um, stretch too much on these, but just try to remember them um, briefly, right? So he will try to sell, he will say like, I will rent this house for $500 for one week. At the end of the week, if, you like the house, you can buy it for $510,000. If you do not like the house at the end of the week, you can just pay the rent and just move on, right? So there is no pressure or no obligation for the tenant to buy the house. He can buy it or he cannot buy it. It's just like a lease, right? Uh, not, not even lease, like these, these days, these, they, the uh, builders will have this thing called you can basically rent a house or lease a house at the end of the lease. If you like it, you can buy the house, right? So similar way, John will buy a house. He will rent it on weekly basis. He, will, he can also rent it on monthly basis. He can also rent it on yearly basis. But then he will also add a clause. But by the end of the lease, if you like the house, you can buy it for so-and-so amount. And then he puts all these points in one document and he calls it as a contract, right? And then we will relate all these things in terms of options world. And we will look at real-time strike, real-time contract, and um, real-time rent. We will look at everything real-time based on this example, okay? So step one, John buys a house. He posts an ad. He gives a particular amount of rent per week or month, and then he will also give a certain amount where he would like to sell the house if the tenant likes it. Remember this point, the tenant can buy the house or just rent the house for a week. It is up to the tenant. The tenant can either buy it or just pay the rent and then just move on. So what is the downside for John? For example, let's look at what are the downsides for John. So John has four or five houses. This is one of it. And he buys it for 500,000, right? His plan is to rent it out for $500 a week. Now, if $500 per week is because the value of the house is 500,000. 
if the value is only 100,000, he will not be able to rent it for $500 per week because the rent is directly proportional to the value of the house. It could be because of the area or it could be because the whole housing market is on raise. For whatever reason, the value of the house is directly proportional to the rent that he would get, right? So what if the house value itself will go down as soon as John buys it for 500,000? Let's say he buys it for 500,000 and then the whole housing market will crash. So John will have to hold the loss on paper because he's not selling the house, for example. So if it goes from 500,000 to 400,000, his capital on paper will go down by 100,000. Now John can still rent the house, but for a lower value because John cannot rent the house for a 510 strike um, because the 510,000 strike will only be like maybe $2 or $3. So he will not be doing that. So what John has to do is John has to keep renting the house for a lower value, um, which will not hit the market. So this part is little, slightly little complex, but when we look at the actual stock, we will understand what we are talking about. So recap, recap of everything, John buys a house for 500,000. He will post an ad, he will say like, Anyone who want to stay in this house for a week, you can pay $500 and then you can stay in this house for a week. And then at the end of the week, if you like the house, if you really like everything, all the features, the whole market, housing market, if you think this house is worth 510,000, you guys can pay me 510,000 and I'm more than happy to sell it off for you. Now, if you don't like the house, you can just pay the rent for 500,000. And then John will pick up the $500, not $500, $500 rent, and then he will find for another tenant for the next week, right? So that is John's plan. John's whole intention is to buy several properties and then rent them out and then collect this $500. And the, if, if any of the tenants are interested in his house, he will just sell it off to them and he will basically look for another property within this 500,000 range. That is John's job. John will not be emotionally attached to the house. John has several houses. John has no differentiation between one house versus other. If someone buys this house, he will buy another one for a similar price. John's main key is finding uh, houses with more value. Like for example, we if for example will will John buy a house like uh, a more uh, a place where the price fluctuation is more? No, John buys for a, at a place where the prices have stabilized, and then John looks for value in the house and not for something that's um, very volatile. Let's just say. If John looks at a posting where a house says like 500,000 today, and then after a week, if the price goes from 500,000 to 150,000, that's very volatile price change. So John will not be interested in that. So John will be looking at a value house where the price have been steadily increasing from last five years or 10 years, and then he looks and targets those properties. And then we will relate those value stocks um, in a minute. So that's John's version, right? So John want to make monthly income. He want to make monthly $500. He want to buy property and he want to rent it out. At the worst case, he will basically uh, sell the property to someone, uh, some of the tenants if they are really interested. Down, downside of John is like, if the price of the house itself will go down, he will potentially be a bag holder and then he will be losing value on, on paper as long as he doesn't sell the house for loss, he's not a loser. But that's where John's skill set is. John has to find a house which has value. He cannot basically buy a house which doesn't have any value. Now, there is other, other side of every transaction. So if John is renting out the house, there is someone who, will be, who should be taking the house for rent, right? So that's Kyla. So 
here is Kaila. Kaila's plan is basically, he thinks that this house will appreciate in value because Kaila thinks that, you know, there is a, a new construction that's going to happen next to this house. And then Kaila has some information. Kaila thinks like, look, this house will go up in value within next one week. And Kaila has Kaila's skill set is to identify houses which will rapidly go up within short amount of time. So Kaila identifies John's property, um, and then Kaila thinks, okay, so this I have shortlisted this property. This the price of this house will go from five hundred and five hundred thousand to five hundred and twenty thousand. And Kaila looks uh, at this ad, and then Kaila thinks like, okay, so if I have to flip this property, I need $500,000, but John made an ad stating I can rent this house for $500 a week and see if the price is going up. If the price is going up, I will sell it for, uh, I'll buy it from John for 510 and then I'll sell it for 520. So Kyla thinks that the price will go up and she she would basically want to rent it from John, and then she basically want to flip it for five hundred and twenty thousand and make a margin of ten thousand between five hundred and ten and five hundred twenty. Because John has a contract that says that he will sell the house for five hundred and ten thousand, no matter what happens. Even if this house hits one million, he he is obligated to sell it for five hundred and ten thousand. He he cannot he can take it back. Um, but then he has to pay the amount to Kyla. So he rents the house for $500 a week, and then she waits, she anticipates. And the trick here is that while waiting for the price to go up, the contract, the rent price will actually go down because there is a price for everything in the market and then Kyla is paying the price for time, right? She's paying the price for her prediction to become right in a certain amount of time. So she rents the house for $500. She thinks the price will go from 500,000 $500, to 520,000. Now there are two outcomes that may come. The price may actually go up. The price may actually go down. The price may actually stay flat. Let's see the scenarios where Kyla can actually make money um, in, in this scenario. Kyla can actually make money if the price goes up. There is only one way that Kyla can make money. That is if the price can actually go up. So let me take a screenshot of this and uh, share that. So I can do some drawing here. So Kyla can only make money if the price goes up. The price goes sideways, Kyla will not be able to make money because the price is not moving up. She made a bet or she assumed that the price will go up and then she bought it, she, she took the rent. She's, she, she, doesn't, she, she doesn't wanna stay inside for a week. She will just hold it because she anticipates the price will go to 520,000, 520K. So that, if that happens, Kyla's, Kyla's contract, which, which she bought for $500, will actually go up if the price goes to 520,000. But if the price stays at 500,000, for example, the price stays at 500,000, Kyla will not be able to make any money because every day passes, the probability of the price increasing from 500,000 to 520,000 is decreasing. Because in a week, in a, in a working week, there are five days, five business days. So if the price does not go up from 500,000 to 520,000 on day one, then the probability will actually be only four days for that to happen. If the price does not go up from 500,000 to 520,000 in the second day, then the probability will go down to three more days. 
And then if that doesn't happen on the third day, we'll go down to two more days and then the final day. So as each day passes, look at this curve here. So imagine this curve as the rent amount. So this is $500 that she paid here, right here. Each day passes, the rental amount will actually go down. She cannot, she cannot sell the rental contract to anyone because this is actually going down. I mean, there are people who can buy it, but she'll have to take a loss, right? So at the end of the fifth day, if the price stays at 500,000, the contract amount that she paid for the rent, $500, will go down to zero. You see, if many times people will buy calls or puts, they will think, the price of the stock will go from X to Y in five days. They will only make money, people like Kyla will only make money if the price goes from X to Y within five days. If the price goes flat or if the price goes down, then they will not be able to make money. Because this right here, this time right here, one, two, three, four, five days. This is where 99% of the options traders will be losing money, not because of this action here. Well, this is a contributing factor too, but I, I, I should say maybe 95% of the people or maybe 90% of the people will be losing money based on wrong estimate of when the price will go up, not because the price will go up or down. Most people will get it right. The price will go up or down because market itself is volatile. It's not because people will make a wrong prediction. It will. It is because people will make a wrong prediction about the time that will make them lose money. So if 90% of the people are losing money who are buying the contract or paying the rent, who who is the 90? Who is the other 10% that, that's making money? That's John. The 10% that are making money in the options world are the people that are actually selling the options contract. They're basically, who are selling uh, or renting their houses. Not people who are buying the rents, who are basically selling the rents, who are basically renting their houses. Not people who are renting the houses, who, who are basically giving their houses for rent. So. This in a nutshell is what a cover call is. Mm -hmm. And instead of house, you have to replace it with 100 stock, 100 shares of a particular stock. So replace everything here with 100 shares, right? So if you have 100 shares, if you are John, if you have 100 shares, and then let's just say you bought, um, let me open a notepad here, and then uh, I will type some text. Okay, so let's uh, make it a little big. <clears throat> so let's say you're John, and let's take our classic ticker Apple, and then you have 100 stock of Apple, you will, you will buy Apple on an average amount of 100 per share. And then you want to rent it on weekly basis for, uh, let's just say, 100 per week. So your capital here that you need is $10,000, you can rent it on a weekly basis for $100 per week. Now, you will have to have a rent amount, which we have covered here. See, we have covered the rental amount, but you should also pick up the strike because your contract should have the rent and it should also have the strike. So let's look at the strike here. So strike, depends on the share value on the day. So 
if apple is trading at let's just say 130 dollars you can pick a strike should be 140 dollars so in a week you think that apple will not go from 130 dollars to 140 dollars you are you are guessing it there is no way you know that if apple is going to go from 130 dollars to 140 dollars in a week that's your guess that's john's guess is thinking that apple will not go from 130 to 140 in one week and then he will say like if apple goes from 130 to 140 i will sell for 140 if not i will keep the 100 dollar premium per week this is the rent that he's collecting this is the strike you see the similarities here so john says like look if Apple goes from 130 to 140, which means 500,000 of the value of the house to 510,000, which he thinks is a fair value, he will sell all his 100 stocks, 100 shares for 140. He originally bought it like for $10,000, but then right now the stock price is at 130. So he's, he's making up some margin above 130 and he says like, look, if Apple goes from 130 to 140, I'm more than happy to sell all of my Apple shares to you for $140. That is a strike. If not, if Apple doesn't go from 130 to 140, he will keep the $100 premium. That's for the rent, right? And then he will rinse and repeat again next week. So let's just say next week, this is week one. Let's just say week two, Apple is trading at 135. He thinks that strike could, could be 145. It, it's just a wild guess. There is no way John could know if uh, Apple will go from 135 to 145. If they announce an Apple car, it could just go from 135 to 150. But he's not bothered about this price action. He's bothered about this. If Apple goes from 135 to 145, I will sell for 145. That is called strike. If not, I will keep the $100 premium per week. The rent. He is not bothered about selling it for 145. He is bothered about the rent. He wants this rent. If some, if if some really like Apple announces an Apple car and if it hits 135 to 150, he will sell it for 145. But he will actually turn around and he will look for another stock within um, 10,000 capital. John's job is to find value stocks. John doesn't care if the stock will go up or down. Um, he will well. He will care if the stock goes down. Let's say let's take another scenario, right? Where the stock goes up, down. Apple is trading at ninety dollars. John will actually sell Apple at. And five. Locking profit. You see, here is the key thing. Here is where people who want to do covered calls will actually lose money. See, when Apple is actually going down, or when um, uh, when actually the price of the house is actually going down from five hundred thousand below five hundred thousand, John will actually sell this property off. He will not bag hold it. John's job is not to backhold it. You see, in a similar way, um, if 
Apple is basically going down from, he bought it for $100 a share. If it is going to $90, John will actually remove the position. John will just sell it off. He will never let Apple touch his base price. That's where people will be successful. That's where people who are selling calls on their stock will make money, not by bag holding. But let's just say for any reason you are bag holding Apple and Apple is trading at $90. Let's just say this did not happen. So there are two options. John can either bag hold it or John can actually sell another contract that says if Apple goes from 90 to 100, I will sell for 100. Break. If not, I will keep the premium per week. Look, his strike will never go below his purchase price. His strike, he will never sell Apple for less than what he has bought. He will never do it. If he's doing that, then he's doing a business that's running in losses. He will never ever sell the stock for less than what he has purchased for. If he has purchased it for $50, he will never sell it less than $50, right? So that in a nutshell is what Cover Call is. So let's just say if we open Think or Swim, and if I have Apple stock for 100, I have Apple 100 shares with me, which I don't have today. And my base price, for example, is um, $100 here, right? So if you pull up the options chain for Apple, let's just say this is Apple chart, for example. If you go to Think or Swim, you go to Trade, this is what the options chain looks like. And then let's just assume you have 100 shares of Apple. And then you think, Right now, the current trading price is 168. And then you think next one week, Apple will not actually cross 175 here. Right? And then what you'll think is, okay, so I will sell a call. Um, so when you're selling, you have to um, click on the bid here. So I will sell a call for $47 saying that if Apple touches or closes more than 175, by end of 18th Feb, I am more than happy to sell Apple for 175. For 175. But if it does not touch 175, I will keep all this um, premium, which is $47. So this $47 is, um, is the premium that you're collecting per week. Right, so this $47 is the premium that you're collecting for week. And if you look at the percentage, um, it's, it's very, very low, right? Like you are investing, let's just say you bought Apple for 10,000, you're collecting, um, you know, $50, close to $50. So that's um, like 0.5% per, 0 um, per week returns that you're getting. But so, but then if you really look back, you actually already logged in a profit of, you know, uh, 7,500 because your base price is $100 a year, right? So from, from 100 and 175, you logged in 175, $7,500 profit, and then you're collecting a weekly premium of $50. And then some, some will say like, no, I don't like, you know, $50, I want a little more. And then they will say like the market is bearish. So I don't think Apple will even touch 170 this week. So instead I will sell this call and then I will collect, you know, $200. So on the other side, there are all these options buyers who will think Apple will actually cross 170 next week because the market is gonna be bullish. No one cares about the war or no one cares about the Fed policies or no one cares about the interest rate hikes. 
So the prices will go up. So they will buy this call by paying $200. Who are they paying this $200 to? They're paying it to John. They're paying it to John. They're paying $200 to John, betting that Apple will go up. But John on the other side is selling this, betting that the stock will not go up to $170. There are three ways John can make money. The stock can go down, John will keep the premium. The stock will trade sideways, John will keep the premium. Only if the stock goes up, John will not make the money. See, John has higher probability than Kyla has because the only way Kyla can make money is if the, if the stock goes up. But John can make money if the stock goes straight sideways or if the stock actually goes down, right? So that's why 90% of the options traders who buys options will lose money, but the other 10% are the people who are actually, you know, the, 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 the 90% who are making money, which is in a broad scheme of things, are the, the 10% are actually people who are selling it, right? But then if you really look at it, the risk reward is actually good for the people who are buying it. Uh, that's why the, the losing ratio is high there. Because if really Apple goes above 170, this contract can go from 200 to 300. They can make 50% profit. But then no matter what happens, John is locking his uh, profit potential to you know 1%, 2% a week. And that's fine for many people. Many people has a lot of capital. They will make a living just by selling calls, right? So if you have a stock if, where you have, you're holding 100 shares, you can earn weekly income by selling the calls. And you can basically sell for 18th, which is uh, this week. Or you just say like, I don't have the time to monitor every week. What I will do is I will I want 200 300 premium, but I will say like by May Apple will not go uh, above 190. So you will collect 300, um, and you will make a bet that by May Apple will not cross uh, 190 dollars, right? So you can basically sell like a year away, right? If you have a longer term prediction that Apple will not cross, let's just say $200 by 2023 Jan, you can collect $800 and you can say like, okay, Apple will not cross uh, $200 mark by Jan 2023. And then you can collect um, $880. Now, what happens if Apple will really cross $200 by, let's just say, December of 2022? Well, you sell all your stock that you bought for $100, you will sell it for $200. Not only are you making 100% profit there by selling the stock, double the value, but you're also collecting this $800 in premium. Instead of just buying and holding stock, you can actually sell a call at a fair amount that you think may or may not be possible, and then you can collect this premium. Let's just say you have Apple, you have Nvidia, you have like any high quality stocks. You can sell calls like this, and then you can make really good percentage in returns, boosting your bottom line. So what if Apple doesn't reach 200, but it will stop at 190 by 20th Jan, 2023? Not only will you keep all your stocks, but shares, but you'll also actually uh, keep this premium of $880. That's the beauty of selling calls. And every day passes, every day Apple doesn't get close to $200. The people who have bought the calls, they will lose the value. Because look here, every day passes, every day you are not getting close to the strike value the contract value will go down for the buyer. Which means the contract, the, the money, the premium that John will keep will actually be going up. Not only the price is in favor of John, even time is in favor of John. Time is 
the very key component here. Every day passes, and every day that this that, that the stock is not close to the strike, the contract value will go down, which is bad for Kyla, but which is good for John. Be like John. Only if you have um, high quality stocks in a um, hundred count, right? So that's one good way of uh, making monthly or quarterly or yearly income based on fixed percentage. You are locking profits here. But what if uh, the stock goes down? What if Apple goes below $100 within uh, one year? Well, that's possible. And in that case, John has to act quick, think quick. He has to sell his call. He has to buy back his call because by the time the price goes from 170 to $100, this will be worthless. He will buy it back and then he will sell it for 105 or 110, the whole stock. He will not bag hold. John is a smart guy. He will not bag hold. He will not let stock go below the price that he has purchased for. He will sell somewhere here, right? So that is in a nutshell covered call. Um, I know it's it could be little, complex for uh, people who are listening for the first time, but then trust me, you do some paper trading uh, on doing covered calls, something called SIM, you will really understand the beauty of covered calls. As a matter of fact, people who are getting into options for the first 365 days should only be selling calls. They should not buy calls. That's a golden rule. But then uh, most of us wouldn't do it. Um, I did it for some time, I think for a few months, and um, I uh, did not like the returns, and I, I switched from uh, selling to buying. While I do often sell calls on some of the stocks that I hold, um, I am not really doing it on a day-to-day basis. Now let's take another scenario where, where basically John wants to buy this house uh, for $500, and but then John really doesn't have uh, John doesn't doesn't really have the capital of five hundred thousand. That's when the credit spreads will come in picture. So, what is the credit spread? Credit spread is you will think that a stock will stay above a certain le- limit. Let's just say next week by eighteenth of Feb. The, does anyone in this call think Apple will go below 150? Like it is at 168. By end of um, Friday, do you think Apple will close below 150? If any of you will think that Apple will not close under under $150, then you can um, basically without owning the stock, you can basically make a bet that Apple will not go below $150 by end of the week and then make money. And I'll show you how. So let's just say you will think 150 is the limit, right? So first you have to pick a strike which is above that um, on a put side, right? So you're bullish and you say like, Apple will not go below 150. So you will buy a put for 145 for $15, and then you will sell a put for $150. That means you are making a bet that says Apple will never go below 150 by end of uh, ATFL. And then for you to make the bet, uh, you will need $500 because the spread difference between 150 and 145 is $500. So you need a collateral of $500. And for you, uh, for making the bet, you will get actually $8 per contract. So you are making, uh, I don't know, like what is it, 1%, maybe about 1% or slightly above 1% for making this bet because, I mean, come on, why will Apple go below 150, right, Uh, in a week? It could happen, but then the chances of it likely happening are very less. Now, if you're using Think or Swim, you can basically right-click on this 
particular vertical and then you can click on analyze trade where you will get the profit and loss and it will basically show you if apple stays above 150 look here 150 if apple stays above 15th by 18th or 19th you will keep the eight dollars here but if if apple closes below 145 which is your lower strike you will, you are actually risking all your five hundred dollars, right? You are actually risking five hundred dollars to make eight dollars. But then, if you really look at it like this, if Apple really goes to one hundred and fifty dollars, that's a lot of market cap that's being shredded from Apple stock. Will that really happen? Like, can Apple drop from one hundred and sixty-eight to one hundred and fifty? maybe not right like most likely it will not drop from 168 to 150 so you will think in probabilities and you'll say like look apple will not drop to 150 and i am ready to risk my find a dollars to make eight dollars right so so that's how you without having a capital of ten thousand dollars you can actually make a bet on um, any stock for that matter. If you think, for example, let's just say Apple will not go to 180, right? If you're, for example, if you're bearish on Apple, you think Apple will not go to 175. What you will do is you will buy a call at 180 and then you will sell the call at 175. Again, you're risking $5 uh, as in like $500 to collect a credit of $40, $40 a week, right? And if you basically click, right click and analyze the trade and uh, let me delete this one and check this one. So if um, Apple closes above 175, you will keep all the $37. But if Apple closes below um, your upper strike, which is $180, uh, or actually if Apple close above it, then you will lose all your $500. You can basically analyze each and every trade um, in Think or Swim with um, the analyze option. So vertical is basically like a credit spread is nothing, but you will not own the stock. You will bet on a direction instead of going directional like instead of just simply buying a call or simply buying a put you will say like okay there is no way apple will go below 150. there is no way it will go below 150 within one week so you will basically buy a put for 145 use that as collateral and then you will sell the put for $20. You'll buy for $5, $15, like there is this spread here. Um, there is a wide spread here. So you, in short, you'll be making here, the credit is $8. But if you really think little aggressive, like forget 150, Apple will not go below 160. That's what you think. Apple will not go below 160 by end of um, this week. So you have $500 in your uh, trading account, and then you'll say like, okay, so I'll risk my $500 to make, um, so you'll buy uh, 155, and then you will um, basically sell 160 put, and then you'll collect a credit of um, $40, $39, right? So if you go to, analyze here you can basically see that if apple closes above 160 you will keep all the 39 dollars but then if apple closes below 155 which is your lowest strike you will lose all your um capital all the 500 minus the um credit that you have received 461 you will lose uh, 461 you will still keep this 39 uh, but you know, you'll lose 461. So Apple has to stay above 160, uh, or actually it has to stay above 160 for you to keep all your premium. 
that you have received right so let's just say let's let's now look at the bearish side of it right so let's look at the bearish side so you believe that apple will never touch 175 right so you buy a call for 180 and then you sell a call for 175 and then you keep the spread of um, you you keep the credit of, of 37 dollars how much are you risking your risk is always the difference between the strikes so you are basically buying 180 you are selling 175 so difference is five dollars five dollars times 100 500 that is your risk your reward is 37 dollars that's about um how much is that that's about uh, maybe eight percent or seven percent six percent something like that so that's your reward per week so in a week if you really can make five percent i would like close my eyes and take the trade that is that is like um probability that has a statistical uh, edge right but how would i know if apple will cross 175 or not so simple so for example i will go to my charts and then i will uh, plot a bollinger band right and um, i will simply plot it i'll not do any changes so if you if any one of you are are like have attended the previous sessions we covered bollinger bands and what is a bollinger band a bollinger band has a 20 day simple moving average in the middle and then it has two standard deviation you can also have one standard deviation it has a two standard deviation and basically what it says is like the price will stay within this um, two standard deviation um, for about 78% um, uh, of the time so you have a 78% probability that the price will stay between 157 and 180 that's how you pick the strikes you pick the strikes based on the standard deviation on the Bollinger Band. You will not randomly go and pick some strike here. No, that doesn't work like that. It's not a fair, it's, it's, not a, it's, it's not good if you do like that because if you're randomly thinking like, oh, Apple will not touch 170, and then you will um, you know, buy a 175 call and then sell 170, then you will receive $160, which is good risk to reward wise because you are risking $500, you are getting $160. But then the probability of Apple actually touching 170 is uh, pretty high. Why? Because if I go here, I will plot Bollinger Bands and then I will basically change from one standard deviation to from two standard deviation to one standard deviation here and then see what the prices look like so the one standard deviation itself is 174 so there is 66 percent chance that the price will stay between 174 and 166 so the price of 170 is an easy target so apple will really really easily hit 170 so for us to really pick uh, strike use uh, Bollinger Bands. So let it's always safe to go to standard deviations ab about the mean price. So let's just say you don't think Apple will touch 180. Why? Because it's the uh, two standard deviation here. So 180 is 47. So you go to trade. You want to sell a $180 strike. So you will buy 185 and then you will pick up a credit of $7. So you will buy 185, you will sell 180. Why 180? Because when you go to the daily chart, 180 is the two standard deviation. Um, and then the, the chances of the price to touch the two standard deviation is, is very, very low. It has a 78% probability where it will stay within this range. And if you actually look at Apple, um, it, while it did touch the two standard deviation, you know, when it is rallying 
Um, but for the most part, if you see, it will be traveling. The the close will always be within the within the two standard deviation, um, seventy eight percent of the time. Right. So based on this calculation, you don't do any math. You let the system do the math. So you you pick a two standard deviation strike here. You say Apple will not go above 180 within this one week. And uh, you come here and then you sell a call. You pick up a $7 credit for risking with a risk of um, $5. Does anyone here think uh, Apple will really go from 168 to 180 in a week? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think not because I don't think so. I don't think because it's statistically, it's not uh, more likely to happen. So can it happen? Of course it can happen. Um, but the chances of it happening are 78% less. Uh, so I would take a bet with a statistical edge. I mean, my statistics is a standard deviation. Now, I also think that not only will Apple not reach 180, it will not even touch 157. So 157.5, right? So I will go to trade and I will say like, okay, so Apple will not go below 157 right now. So what I will do is I will um, buy 152.5 and then I will sell 157. So what I'm doing is I'm basically saying Apple will close in between the two standard deviation. Let me remove the one standard deviation so I will not confuse you. So Apple will basically, it will close between the two standard deviation. So I'm basically making a bet that Apple will close between these two lines here. These are the two standard deviations. I'm saying Apple will close between 157 and 180 within next one week. And then you're collecting a $34 premium for a $1,000 um, for a $1,000 um, uh, capital. So as long as Apple stays here, if you right click on it and click on analyze, as long as Apple stays between 157 to 180 in next one week, you will keep all the $34. Now the capital that you're dropping in might be a little high. I agree to that. But then percentage wise, I think it's about uh, 3%, I think. I think it's about 3%, I guess. Right? So 3% a week. I think um, there, was, there was some discussion er earlier that, you know, we want to make like 2%, 3%, 5% a week or 10% a week. The only way that you can probably make a safest bet and collect like 2%, 3%, 5% a week is by um, credit spreads. And then when you have more than two legs, you actually have a spread on the bullish side and you also have a spread on the bearish side that's actually called an iron condom, right? So if you go to analyze, see, you have to stay above 157 and you also have to stay uh, under 180 and then you can collect all this premium. So that, in a nutshell, is about credit spreads and iron condors. And um, I know it's um, kind of a lot of information in one single session. If you guys think that you have any more questions, we can have another session just to cover uh, credit spreads, for example. Uh, but then it's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, look at it. You just pick anything, just pick spy. And then you plot Bollinger Bands with a two standard deviation here. This is a default indicator. You don't need any special indicators. You know the strikes, 464 is the upper limit, 429 is the down limit. And you basically pick those as strikes on SPY. And then uh, 464, you go to trade, and then uh, you delete this trade. You can actually, on SPY, you can do it on um, the, um, uh, the zero day expiry also. So it says 464, right? 464, you get nothing, basically. You get nothing because, I mean, the, the prices are factored in in a way that it's zero probability for that to happen. 
so you'll not make any money. You have to make sure that the spread has some value. Like you'll have to, you know, go a little deep. Or maybe you can go for 18th Feb and then uh, you can pick well, 14 and um, 464. Yeah. For a week, um, I can risk um, 464 and um, 469. So. This is how you can pick. You can um, make a uh, vertical here. You can say like, okay, Apple will not cross 469, and then you can um, basically uh, pick another leg on the upside where you can say like, um, Apple will not go down, downside Apple will not go down under 429. So you can uh, sell this, uh, and uh, you can buy, 424, I guess. You can collect a credit of um, $94, um, risk uh, $1,000 here, I believe. You can right click and analyze, and you can see, like, as long as Pi stays between uh, the two standard deviation, you will collect uh, $94. That's not bad. That's about, um, about 9%, I believe. So that's not bad. That's a so if credit spread, uh, there are two questions. So one is, I have question picking Stripe for leap cover calls. For leaps, uh, simple, you go to weekly charts and then you basically change uh, standard deviation to four or you go to monthly chart and then you basically, you know, uh, and then you just pick the strikes. Uh, for weekly, and more or less like um, you just pick the four standard deviation and sell those calls if you want for credit spreads. So the difference between ask and bid is zero point. How do we get this um, eight dollars? It's um, basically between the bid and ask on um, each strike, right? We have to calculate the bid and ask on each strike. So the bid and ask on four hundred twenty, for example, is three cents. But then uh, you also have to look at the bid and ask between these two. And then you will basically get a, a difference between ask and uh, bid, for example. That's how you make money between this. So uh, for leaps, yeah, you can go with um, you know the weekly charts, and then you can plot the uh, standard deviation on that. So if credit spread crosses the strikes, there is one easiest way where you can basically roll it forward, which we are not covering in this session, but then uh, we will cover it in the next session on how to roll forward the spreads um, when the price is actually coming close to your uh, strike price. Um, so we will cover that in the next uh, session, uh, not next one, next to next session, where we will cover how to manage um, credit spreads. Uh, that, that itself is a big topic because um, uh, there are a few variables that we have to look at while doing that. So we will do another session for uh, managing the credit spreads or managing iron condors. For this session, it's um, basically for us to go through what are covered calls, the concepts of covered calls, credit spreads, and uh, how do we analyze credit spreads uh, using Think or Swim platform. Analyze tab here. This is like a, this is like a, a gold mine. So many people don't use it start using analyze tab. You can pick any strike and then you can just, um, you know, uh, just click on analyze, you'll have a view. You can change the dates, it will show you the probability. Uh, if you change the dates, it will show you even probability based on the delta, theta, the variables. So keep an eye on, um, Keep an eye on uh, the analyze tab and um, look for probabilities. Do some paper trading on uh, credit spreads and cover calls. And that is the safest best bet for you to make um, anywhere between five to 10% per week. Um, if you guys are handling with, um, uh, with a good account size, like let's say you have an account size of, um, you know, 30,000, for example, you guys can easily make like um, somewhere around 2000. Uh, if you're very, very conservative, you can actually make 500 per week 
um, using credit spreads if you really know what you're doing. I was actually back in uh, back in those days um, uh, when I started credit spreads. I was actually making hundred and fifty dollars a week every week uh, with a two thousand five hundred uh, portfolio just for credit spreads. I set two thousand five hundred dollars aside just to make credit spreads. If there is any strategy that I was consistently profitable, that is credit spreads. I was consistently profitable for a, for about three months, um, and um, with a two thousand five hundred dollar account, I was actually able to make hundred to hundred and fifty dollars every single week, every single week. So that's uh, that's quite a feat that I did. And later I switched from credit spreads to directional for various reasons, but uh, I can say without a shadow of doubt that credit spreads are by far the most um, successful strategies. So we will continue to make more sessions on credit spreads and collecting premiums. Um, this is the first session. I want to give a quick overview of how the system works. So if you have um, any questions, feel free to post in the options group. I'll be more than happy to answer them there. Uh, we are about the mark. 